Tejo Vari Medam Yata Vini Mayo Yatra Chisargo Mesha Damna Swena Sadal Niras the Kuha comes at Yam Param Di Mahi O my Lord Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O all pervading personality Godhead. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primal cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji? The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Pojita Kaitra Votra Paramo Nirmatsarunam Satam Vedyam Vastavam Atra Vastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamani Krite Kimba Purir Ishwaraha Sadyo Hridi Avarudyate Tra Krite Bihi Susubis Takshanat Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truths, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. is sufficient in itself for God-realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpatara galitam falam sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam Pibata Bhagavatam Rasam Alayam Muhur Aho Rasika Bhuvi Bhavukaha O expert and thoughtful man, relish Srimad Bhagavatam, the mature fruit of the desire to read Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Even though its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls, Shinvatam Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hediantak Stohi Bhadrani Vidunati Srihitsatam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear about him directly through the Bhagavad Gita, is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna who is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend and purifies a devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. 
Nasta presu badresu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistaki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhava kamalo badayas cheta etare navidam stitvam satve prasiddhati By development of devotional service, he becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, um, and thus material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat tattva vigyanam mukta sangasya jayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. <clears throat> Becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasamsaya siyante chasikarmani drista evat manishwari Thus, Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16, Verse Number 7. Shudra Yusam Nidam Anga. Varatyanam ritam ichatam iho pahuto bhagavan mityu samitya karmani Translation by Srila Prabhupada O Sutta Goswami, there are those amongst men who desire freedom from death and get eternal life. They escape the slaughtering process by calling the controller of death Yamaraj. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The living entity, as he develops from lower animal life to a higher human being, and gradually to higher intelligence, becomes anxious to get freed from the clutches of death. Modern scientists try to avoid death by physiochemical advancement of knowledge. But alas, the controller of death, Yamaraj, is so cruel that he does not spare even the very life of the scientist himself. The scientist who puts forward the theory of stopping death by advancement of scientific knowledge becomes himself a victim of death when he is called by Yamaraj. What to speak of stopping death? No one can enhance the short period of life even by a fraction of a moment. The only hope of suspending the cruel slaughtering process of Yamaraj is to call him to hear and chant the holy name of the Lord. Yamaraja is a great devotee of the Lord, and he likes to be invited to kirtanas and sacrifices by the pure devotees, who are constantly engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. Thus, the great sages, headed by Sonak and others, invited Yamaraja to attend the sacrifice performed at Naimisharanya. This was good for those who did not want to die. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Well, today, 
people have become so dumb that they want to die. And the reason they want to die is because um, they're frustrated. They can't get everything they want. And maybe they get sick, or maybe they're uh, chronically frustrated, so they don't see any way that they can be happy in the future. So they want to die. And their prayer is, after death, please let there not be anything. So this is a bankrupt, intellectually bankrupt person. They have become so overwhelmed by misery that uh, they think their salvation is death. Where well, it's not, in the least bit. Uh, there is life after death. And there is uh, a judgment that everyone has to go through. In life, everyone is going through judgments all the time. Taking a, an SAT test is a judgment to see whether you learned something or not in school whether you're eligible to go to a higher institution of knowledge and uh, getting an interview to get a job is a test to see if you qualify for that particular company and that particular job. And uh, you have to learn how to drive to get a driver's license. You go through a test and you need to get a uh, a food service permit in order to serve food. And there's an infinite number of tests that you have to take. And there's always judgments. So uh, sometimes you have an IRS investigation of your tax returns. And sometimes uh, there, there may be divorce or sometimes there, you, you, you get a ticket and you want to defend yourself in court. So all these things are happening. So why is, does it seem strange that you should be judged or we all should be judged uh, at the moment of death or right after death by someone like Yamaraj? So instead of being afraid of Yamaraj, we should invite him. Invite him to come to uh, kirtans and classes. The only hope of suspending the cruel slaughtering process of Yamaraj is to call him to hear and chant the holy name of the Lord. Yamaraj is a great devotee of the Lord, and he likes to be invited to kirtanas and sacrifices by the pure devotees who are constantly engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. Thus, the great sages headed by Sonaka and others invited Yamaraj to attend the sacrifice performed at Naimisharanya. This was good for those who did not want to die. So we should invite Yamaraj to the Vedic Cultural Center also. Why not? He's a devotee. There's no reason to be afraid of him. And he might even be kind to us at the moment of death. Who knows? We don't really uh, say a devotee doesn't have any demand. Uh, doesn't put forward any demand. This is explained uh, very nicely in the Krishna book, where is a, there's an explanation of what is an appropriate prayer for a devotee. The people are always praying nowadays asking for something from Krishna. But uh, that's not an appropriate prayer. However, uh, appropriate prayer is the following. Room 10. Mm. One second to find that. Twenty-three, four. Mm 
Hmm. Can't believe it's not here. Well, in the Krishna book, chapter 69, uh, there is uh, a prayer by Narada Muni. What is this prayer? He prays to Krishna, I don't really want anything material. But if you want to offer something to me, please let me always be able to remember you. Yeah, he says here, uh, You are the only shelter of all conditioned souls. My dear Lord, you have very kindly asked what you can do for me. In answer to this, I simply request that I may not forget your lotus feet at any time. I do not care where I may be, but I pray that I constantly be allowed to remember your lotus feet. Remember yesterday? I think it was yesterday we were talking about how there is uh, sweetness or honey available from the lotus feet of the Lord. Well, what is that sweetness? What is that honey? That is, at the lotus feet of the Lord, we can remember the Lord. And that's very sweet. So Prabhupada writes, By asking this benediction from the Lord, the sage Narada showed the ideal prayer of all pure devotees. A pure devotee never asks for any kind of material or spiritual benediction from the Lord. His only prayer is that he may not forget the lotus feet of the Lord in any condition of life. A pure devotee does not care whether he is put into heaven or hell. He is satisfied anywhere, provided he can constantly remember the lotus feet of the Lord. Lord Chaitanya taught this same process of prayer in his Sikshastika, in which he clearly states that all he wanted was devotional service birth after birth. A pure devotee does not even want to stop the repetition of birth and death. To a pure devotee, it does not matter whether he has to take birth again in the ver various species of life. His only ambition is that he not forget the lotus feet of the Lord in any condition of life. So now we have authoritative evidence here of what is a prayer. And so asking Krishna, please bless me so I can always remember you, that is not a material desire. And that's not exactly a spiritual demand. It is simply a statement of fact that the devotee is surrendered at the lotus feet of the Lord, and there's nectar there. The nectar is remembering the Lord and his pastimes and his instructions. Just like when Yudhisthira was preparing for death, he was remembering uh, uh, instructions that he received and so forth. So uh, there is nectar at the lotus feet of the Lord, and it's remembering his transcendental pastimes and in other words, not forgetting him. So, uh, everything is in the Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, even how to pray. So, most prayers by devotees are glorification of the Lord. Just like Narada Muni here, he says, I know that your lordship has descended to this earth for the proper maintenance of the whole universe. Your appearance, therefore, is not forced by any other agency. By your sweet will only, you agree to appear and disappear. It is my great fortune that I have been able to see your lotus feet today. Anyone who becomes attached to your lotus feet is elevated to the supreme position of neutrality and is uncontaminated by the material modes of nature. Now, what is this position of neutrality? It's extremely important to know. It's explained in many different places by Prabhupada. What it means is that one does not have any rancor or envy or any kind of... Uh, let's say, uh, 
a desire to get revenge. Uh, the state of neutrality and equality is superior to prasanatma, self-satisfaction. Ramabhuta prasanatma na sochati na kanksati. So when one is free of hankering and desires, material desires, uh, they become prasanatma, self-satisfied. Material desires agitate the mind of a person because they have to do so many things to get what they want. If you have no material desires, then you're not agitated. So you become uh, satisfied uh, within yourself. However, superior to that is the state of neutrality and equality. So equality means you understand that you're part and parcel of Krishna, qualitatively one, quantitatively different. And the same Krishna is in the heart of every living entity, including your heart and every other living entity. However, this neutrality means that you're not disturbed by anything that happens. You accept both happiness and distress as the mercy of the Lord. That's uh, transcendental. That's the begin Actually, that's the real beginning of spiritual life transcendental life when you're no longer disturbed by anything that happens and you see everything as the mercy of the lord and you accept the lord as your only protector so you have complete confidence in the statements of the lord even though there are difficult and trying times you accept that as the mercy of the lord to help you remember him more and to become more dependent on it. So this life of dependence on the Lord is something people have a problem with. They think, if I have to depend on someone, I'm not independent. But actually, you become free, you develop tremendous freedom by being completely dependent on the Lord, which seems to be an oxymoron. It seems to be uh, something that doesn't, is not rational, but it is. Because when you take shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord, you are tasting nectar always. And you're not disturbed because you have something so great that anything else, whether it's misery or pain, seems insignificant. Just like if you have a million dollars in the bank and you lose $10, you're not worried at all. But if you only have $12 and you lose $10, you're worried. See? So if we have a bankrupt bank account of spiritual life, then we're always worried. But if your, your bank account, spiritual bank account, has billions and billions of assets, which are the service that you've done unselfishly for the pleasure of Krishna, to please Guru and Krishna, then you're not worried about anything. You know exactly what's going to happen to you in this lifetime and exactly what's going to happen to you after death. You'll always be engaged in some kind of devotional service. So that new state of neutrality is extremely important. It's, it's the real beginning of transcendental life. Of course, to become prasanatma is good. But even the Mayavadis attain state of prasanatma. Nasochati na kanksati. But attaining the state of neutrality and equality is something superior. So... Therefore, you have to come to the level of Krishna in order to understand Krishna. So what is the level of Krishna? He's not influenced by the modes of material nature. And he is neutral in, in his uh, like relationships uh, with the living entities. However, there's another aspect to this. And that is that all, all, although he's equal to every, he is neutral in all of these relationships, still he's preferential or he's, he's partial for his devotees. And this is a normal thing because let's say your child was visiting the, uh, the neighbor's family, the neighbor, and who has children also, and he's playing with them. And all of a sudden, the neighbor's house catches fire. So, 
if you run over to the neighbor's house seeing fire coming out of the windows and people screaming, and you run into the house, whose child would you save first, your child or the neighbor's child? Which one? Right. Then, after you save your child, you might go back in again a second time, save the neighbor's child. So the same way, Krishna says, Samaham sarvabhute su nami dve sustina priya ye bhajanti tumam parta mai te te su chapyaham. Ninth chapter, 29th verse, he says, I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. I am equal to all. But whoever renders service unto me in devotion is a friend, is in me, and I am also a friend to him. So Prabhupada says in the purport, one may question here that if Krishna is equal to everyone and no one is a special friend, then why does he take a special interest in the devotees who are always engaged in his transcendental service? This is a, this is a bona fide question. One may question here that if Krishna is equal to everyone and no one is his special friend, then why does he take special interest in the devotees who are always engaged in his transcendental service? Prabhupada says, but this is not discrimination. It is natural. Any man in this material world may be very charitably disposed, yet he has a special interest in his own children. The Lord claims that every living entity, in whatever form, is his son. And so he provides everyone with a generous supply of the necessities of life. Yeah, there's this one devotee who asked Prabhupada a question. He said, Prabhupada, in America, there's a lot of prosperity, but I don't see anyone worshiping Lord Shiva. So because Prabhupada is explaining that the followers of Shiva are usually wealthy. So he says, he said, I, I don't see them worshiping Shiva. How are they getting all this wealth and, uh, and this material advancement? Now, Prabhupada's answer is absolutely unexpected and amazing. He said, oh, America is not materially advanced. And it was like, <laughs> how is he saying that, right? He said, this, America is not materially advanced. And what he meant was, and then he explained it, he said, the Americans are frustrated. In India, they might be dying of, of starvation, but in America, they're dying of frustration. And they're in anxiety. Look at all the anxiety right now. You know, what's going to happen? You know, who's going to be elected? And what's going to happen after the election? And uh, how are we going to pay the, down the debt to the United States? And, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm losing my job, you know. And... Uh, how am I going to get another job in this economic downturn, this thing, that thing? My kids are becoming atheists, and uh, my wife hates me, and I hate my wife. And You know, people are going crazy. You see, almost every day somebody kills their wife and kids in, in, in the United States. And so many things are going wrong. So Prabhupada's answer was amazing. He said, I don't see them as being materially advanced. I see them as being frustrated why are the kids turning into hippies and why is you know why is you know at that time there was you know protests against the vietnam war just like today there's protests you know black lives matter and this thing and that thing so he said I don't, they're not materially advanced and then he explained what it means to be materially advanced materially advanced means that you have uh, nice cows they give you plenty of milk and you have grains and fruits and vegetables and you can eat sumptuously and have a very simple life uh, simple living high thinking so that is materially advanced so you see how uh, his answer was very amazing and the devotee they asked the question he was amazed by the answer I mean you didn't expect to hear that America is not really materially advanced but if you listen carefully to Prabhupada's answer, it's a fact. Advancement means that you're living peacefully. Your mind is not agitated at all. And you can think of Krishna, not stink all the time, but you can think of Krishna. 
Most people are stinking all the time. In fact, there, it's some months ago, there was an article in the newspaper that said that wife killed her husband. Why? Because he was always passing bad air in the house. <laughs> she actually killed him. <laughs> so uh, that's why people are stinking. They're not thinking. So, uh, but for his devotees, Krishna gives special attention. Such devotees are mentioned here. They're always in Krishna consciousness, and therefore they're always transcendentally situated in Krishna. The very phrase Krishna consciousness suggests that those who are in such consciousness are living transcendentalists situated in him. The Lord says here distinctly, Maite, they are in me. Naturally, as a result, the Lord is also in them. This is reciprocal. This also explains the words, Ye yatamam papadyante tamstataiva bajamyaham. Whoever surrenders unto me, Krishna says, proportionately, I take care of him. See, that's another alternate translation of that verse, 411. This transcendental reciprocation exists because both the Lord and the devotee are conscious. So anyway, the, the main point here is that uh, we have no reason to be afraid. Uh, and why? Because even Yamaraj is not scary for a devotee. Because he's a devotee and he enjoys kirtan. So what should be our main activity in life? Harinam Sankirtan. That means that uh, Narada Muni is there and all great Sages are there when they hear this kirtan, including Yamaraj. So we should not be afraid of anything. The only thing we should be afraid of is falling into Maya. Prabhupada once says it, that, that uh, we should not, just like if you see a, a poisonous cobra, you don't go up to it and say, try and shake hands with it or play with it. You know, you stay away. It's, it's a dangerous thing. So, therefore, fools run in where angels fear to tread. This is a state. This is a proverb in English. It means that when the fools see a casino, they're running there enthusiastically, can't wait to get in. Or they see a flesh so they can't wait to get in. But uh, devotees, they don't go anywhere near those things. Only fools run in where angels fear the tread because they know this is maya. It's going to take my mind away from Krishna. And I want, my life's purpose now is to keep my mind always focused on Krishna. That's where the nectar is. So this fear of death, this fear of whatever it is, is unnecessary when we take complete shelter of Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Are there any questions? Yes. Well, chanting our, and hearing our, go together. When you chant Hare Krishna, the, the best way is to chant it loud enough that you can hear it yourself. So that creates a closed circuit between the vibration of the holy name and the uh, hearing of it, right? So there's a closed circuit, meaning, meaning it's coming out of your mouth, going into your ears, right into your mind, and then coming out of your mouth, into the ears, into your mind. And that way you become purified. So that's why yogis, when they meditate, they're not allowed to close their eyes completely, but they're not allowed to keep their eyes open completely either. They have to have their eyes half open. Nowadays, people meditate, they close their eyes, you know, and then they go to sleep. <laughs> and they think, they say, 
oh, that was a wonderful meditation. You know, I got such deep sleep. You know, but uh, no, you have to be conscious all the time. So therefore, the devotee is conscious by chanting and hearing. They're connected. They go together. They're not separate. You don't just chant. You don't just hear. You chant and hear. Someone is chanting, you're hearing. Then you're chanting, they're hearing. Right? So they're not separate. They go together. That way it's most effective. Whereas the Maya bodies, they don't hear anything. They just meditate, right? And, they, and eventually go to sleep. <laughs> They're not conscious, fully conscious, you know. With the devotee, well, I'm not saying real yogis, they never really close their eyes. But most of them just close their eyes. But the devotee, even the Christians, when they pray, they close their eyes, they bow their head down like this. And then, yes. Yes. Like, uh, please, Krishna, let me build this temple. Yes. The only thing the devotee says, please let me never forget you. Please let me always remember you. You don't have to ask for anything. Why? Because Krishna knows what you need. But... It's in his hands. It's not in your hands. So you just focus on glorifying the Lord. And uh, Krishna Matir Astu. That's a benediction. That's the benediction. May you always remember Krishna. So that's the whole point. If you can fix your mind on Krishna, then you are liberated. Tasmat Sarve Sukha. Therefore, at all times, Arjuna, uh, do your duty and remember me. By your, with your mind and intelligence fixed on me, surely you will come to me. So that's, our, that's, what, that's what meditation is, fixing the mind uh, and, and the senses on Krishna, pleasing Krishna. Then we're Krishna conscious. Then we're in a transcendental position. Then we'll never forget Krishna. And, and we don't have to ask for anything. It doesn't matter whether we go to hell, whether we're having problems or whatever. It doesn't matter because we just continue our service and depending on Krishna. See, our independence is dependence. You're independent of the influence of the modes of material nature. You're not independent of, of God, but you're independent of the influence of modes of material nature, of maya. So you're free. You have real freedom. But you gain the freedom by dependence, not by independence, you see. So everything is backwards in the material world today. You know, people think, no master, no God, right? Then I'm independent. No one tells me what to do. No, that's not true. Then your mind and your lust is telling you what to do. But when you depend completely on Krishna, then you're independent. You're independent. You're free of maya. You're free of illusion. That's real independence. And then you realize, look, I don't need all these things. If I can uh, grow some uh, grains and vegetables and have a cow and a little bit of land, uh, then my economic problem is solved. And I have more time to, uh, you know, you, you work real hard in the summertime and you have, you know, six to eight months of uh, chanting and dancing and feasting. You're supposed to eat sumptuously. Uh, not too much, but it should be sumptuous. It should be very satisfying. So whenever you cook with milk and ghee, and yogurt, it's going to be good. So that's that's called Krishna consciousness, simple living, high thinking. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
because anybody who's going to die, so if even if you go to something you don't have of death, what's the meaning of that? A meaning is that they're really stupid people. They're not smart. How can you stop something that's inevitable? So instead of stopping their involvement with Maya, they want to do something impossible, like stop death. Right? Uh, the devotee knows that the soul is eternal. Not, only the body is going to die, so they're not afraid of it. And they're not in anxiety about it. Because after death, there's still life for a devotee. It's a life of devotional service. So the devotee knows that after death, he's going to go somewhere where he can continue this server, Krishna or, and, and Guru and Krishna. So people that have, don't have faith in these things, they're in anxiety. And, and they're trying to find artificial ways, uh, just like uh, Ravana wanted to build a staircase to the heavenly planet so no one had to do any austerities or uh, any type of uh, uh, pujas or anything like that. They could just walk up to heaven. Of course, that failed. So these, those type of strategies uh, simply indicate that someone is intellectually bankrupt. They have no understanding of what is life, what is the meaning of life, what's the goal of life, how to attain that goal. They, they artificially are looking for mechanical ways to do things, just like the uh, planets are staying in perfect orbits for millions of years. But the scientists, in order to put a space station in, you know, like 200 to 400 miles into, into space away from the surface of the Earth, which is nothing compared to space, right? They have to, you know, they have to uh, wire up the uh, space station with, you know, eight miles of uh, wires, electrical wires, and and uh, hundreds of uh, computers, and uh, hundreds and millions of lines of uh, uh, computer uh, programming, and this and that, to keep uh, a satellite in, form, in the size of a football field in space between 200 and 400 miles away from the surface of the Earth for 20 years, right? They go through this huge expenditure of money, time, thousands of people involved, uh, and all these wires and plastics and metals, and put it all together and uh, to keep this little tiny, insignificant space satellite or station in the air. And it's only like through two to 400 miles away from the surface of the Earth. And they call that a great achievement. Whereas you see these gigantic satellites called the sun, the moon, uh, the earth, and, and they're in perfect orbits for millions of years. And there's no wires. This is some mysterious technology involved, right? They ignore all that and they try and reproduce it mechanically. And it's, it's silly, it's, it's childish, it's, it's, it's a waste of time and money. And they think they've accomplished something great. They haven't really. What's, what's accomplished great is what you see. Krishna is the great scientist. He knows how to keep the planets, real satellites. I mean, all these things, the space station and Sputniks are called artificial satellites. But the natural satellites are the, are the planets. And somebody put them there in perfect orbit or orbits, just like somebody put the space station where it is in an orbit, right? It didn't happen by accident. So that, therefore, you can understand the planets didn't happen by accident. Accident, but no, they're not rational. They said no, it all happened by accident. Our thing didn't happen by accident, and that's crazy. It's it's not rational. It's it's it's. Uh, really 
due to false ego that they refuse to accept that there's someone superior to them. Whereas the whole purpose of reading Bhagavad Gita is to accept that there's someone superior to us. Right? There's a statement like that in the Bhagavad Gita. Let me see if I can find it. So, therefore, trying uh, to uh, stop death, there's no reason to do that. Because you don't die. Your soul is eternal. Only the temporary body dies. You already died many times in this lifetime. What happened to the body when you were six years old, when you were 16, when you are 26? They're all gone. But you're still there. Yeah, so, okay, we'll stop there. And I'll try and find this thing. Uh, Yeah, okay. It's in the uh, fifth chapter, 17th verse. Fifth chapter, 17th verse, it says, The whole Bhagavad Gita centers around the declaration that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. That is the version of all Vedic literatures. That means that we are subordinate to Krishna. But the scientists say, oh, we have the, uh, the high acceleration uh, tunnel in the, in the border of France and Switzerland, and we have created the God particle. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> crazy guys. <laughs> They're completely insane. <laughs> <laughs> spending billions of dollars, they created so-called one God particle, you know, the, through... Yeah. Now, they're, they're worse because they're, they're will, they know that they're not getting anything substantial, but they're doing these big projects in order to keep getting money. This one to destroy this world. Yeah. And they're getting big money, grants. They always get grants. See, every college PhD professor has to has to produce papers and and studies so that he can get grants to continue having a job, right? And so they they make things up. Like for example, for twenty years they studied the family, right? And after twenty years, they came to the conclusion that you do need a husband and wife to raise a child. Now, wait a minute. We, we don't need to spend $20 million and 20 years to figure that out. <laughs> we already knew that. <laughs> but no, see, they get grants. As long as they get those grants and they, they keep making up the phony studies, they're in business. There has not been a major discovery, scientific discovery, since the end of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. That's when they figured out how to, how to uh, uh, use electromagnetism. There has not been another major discovery since then, right? So they're just going on, on that one thing and just keep making things related to that, you know, cell phones and, and videos and television and radio and all that stuff. There hasn't been anything since then, and they know it. But they keep manufacturing things, right? What they do, see, previously, uh, Max Planck and real, real scientists, they came up with uh, theories that were provable, right? But not perfect, but they were provable, right? But now they come up with theories that you can't prove it or disprove it. That's their trick now, like a black black hole. You can't you can't prove it exists or it doesn't exist because <laughs> you know by definition, if you go near it, you you're dead, right? Just like they say, you know, arsenic. I mean, uh, uh, this one poison. Uh, oh, get the name anyway. Has no taste. Why? Because anyone tastes it dies immediately. Cyanide, yeah, cyanide doesn't have a taste. It does have a taste, but anybody who tastes it, they die. 
so they can't live to explain what the taste is. You, you die so quickly, you see? So the scientists, all their theories now, you know, black holes, quarks, uh, string theory, all that, you can't prove that it exists. See, whereas Newton's three laws of, uh, of mechanics, of mo motion, they, was, they were able to prove it, that it's actually factual, but in a limited frame. But it took them 400 years to figure out it's only true in certain l limitations, you know. But it is true. Right? But when you start getting into the theory of relativity, which is, you know, it, 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 it is provable because even in the Bhagavatam they talk about relativity, right? But when you get into black holes and quarks and all that stuff, you can't prove it exists. And that way they, they keep getting the money. And, and the biggest cheater was this Stephen Hawkins. He was a he was he was a nonsense guy, and he kept changing his theory <laughs> of uh, black holes. Same. He changed it like three, four times in a in a thirty year period. Yeah. Well, not not only that, they they're bullies. They know there's no